Um, welcome to Vera Hanaway, who now lives in America, but during the Second World War was evacuated out of Liverpool to our local area here. Vera is currently on holiday and staying in Liverpool, and today has very kindly agreed to be met at Chester Station by Jill and to join us here in Threepwood at Jill's home, the Holy Land, to recount some of her memories of her time spent in this area. Also joining us today are Dudley, Paula, myself and Jill from the committee of the History Group who may also be taking part in the following discussion. So maybe Vera, can I ask you the first question of when and how did you get to our area here all those years ago? Can I start with the bombing and the reason why? Yep. Um, well, my twin Shirley and I were born over a shop in Park Lane, Liverpool, next to the Swedish church, very close to the city and, of course, very close to the docks. And so we were a direct, a direct hit. And we'd be in the cellar under the stairs and all the sweet bottles would be falling off the shelves and so forth and it just wasn't, you know, a very nice thing to go through. The first time we were evacuated, which was not compulsory, the British government could not make the British people send their children away. The Churchill and the different people had discussed this before the war started. They knew there would be air raids and there would be bombing and the thinking about the people and decided that if they sent the children away, and they were safe that the younger generation of the British people would be saved and also in case there was an invasion that these children would survive. First time we went away was the school we were going to, we were be six at the time, St Peter's School in Seal Street. The school was bombed, we weren't there at the time, but the school was bombed and we went with St Peter's School to Chester. And to give you an idea of what was going on, I'll tell you the different houses we were in. The first house was with a Mrs Hughes and I thought, I love that name Mrs Hughes, I'm going to be Mrs, any of you named Hughes now? I'm going to be Mrs. Hughes when I grow up. Didn't realise I'd have to find a Welshman to marry to be a Mrs. Hughes. And I thought she was about 103, this woman, but she could have been in her 60s. She seemed old. And there were two of us were in that little house. And then one day somebody picked us up and took us to a farm. It was pouring with rain and what the people wanted to do was make us happy. So we went to this farm, we're in the mud, there are other children from the farm there, they're all excited and smiling and happy to see these new kids. Somebody picked me up and put me on the back of a horse, it was a big hard horse and I got hysterical when the horse moved and I felt the spine moved and they took me off quickly. And it didn't work that they were going to make us happy because we hated the mud, the rain, and the horse, and the farm. So we were on our way back, we're in a car, and the woman who's driving said, you're not going back to Mrs Hughes, you're going to another house. Oh, why? And they said, well, Mrs Hughes is sick. They didn't say sick of us. <laughs> what's wrong with it well she has a cold or well, the poor lady you know she's doing her bit for the war and she's going to take these children in well two six-year-olds just would be impossible she was on her own so the next house we went to was a great big posh house and the couple that lived there looked as though they were out of the movie. The young woman, they were probably in their twenties, she had long golden hair on her shoulders and the husband looked like a movie star and nicely dressed. 
And my older sister, Pauline, she was eight years older than us. She was also an evacuee. She would pick us up, give us, come to the house. She wasn't living with us, she was somewhere else. She would come to the house, give us our breakfast, take us to school, bring us home from school, give us our tea and put us to bed. Never did see the people that we were living with in the week. And then the next thing is, we're moving from there. And they were probably called up into the service so they couldn't look after us. They would have gone in as officers and know that. The next house we went to was a regular semi-detached little bungalow house in Chester. And I remember the woman saying, when you brush your teeth, use warm water. And I felt, Mama never said use warm water. Why does she want us to, and I understand children have divorced, that's what they go through with different parents, like one will have one rule and one another, going off the track now. So anyway, my sister Pauline, who was eight years older, she was no longer eligible to be evacuee. At 14, you were no longer an evacuee, you were leaving school, you had to come back to Liverpool. So my mother said, bring the twins with you. So that was three houses we were in, in a matter of probably a couple of months. So we went back to Liverpool. And my mother said, I'll never send you away again. So the next thing is, the next stage is, my brother, who was in the Royal Navy, He'd been in the Merchant Navy, he was in the Royal Navy, was torpedoed. He was picked up by a British ship. But when he was torpedoed and they're floundering around in the water, when he came home he said he couldn't understand why some of the men in the water didn't fight harder for their lives, they just went down. And he was helping with bits of wood and pulling them onto the things to save them. But they just gave up. And he was, you know, he would be about 24, 25. And he was strong and he was a swimmer. And he was athletic looking. So, he has to go away again. They've got another ship for him. And he's ready to leave on a second ship. And he said to my mother, I want you to send the twins away again because I want to have something to live for. Not to die for, to live for. He didn't say that, but I think that. He wanted to have, he wasn't married, he wanted to have a family to come back to. And he's thinking, why didn't these men try and save themselves? Maybe they don't have families. Maybe they don't have wives and children. They just gave up. So he wanted to have something to come back to in case the family was bombed out and they were all killed. He knew we would be safe. So we went away again. We went to, we met the school because we've moved to the suburbs by now. And we were, Mama was taking us to the school. We were going to be evacuated with St. Clair. And as we got up the road, we saw the kids leaving the school and we just tagged on at the end of the line and walked with them. And we got a bus or a tram car, I don't know. And we were the last on. The parents couldn't come with you. The parents didn't know where you were going because they did it as a precaution so that nobody knew there was a train of evacuees going and there'd be no, um, you know, bombs or sabotaging the trains. You had to write when you got there or the foster people did. Now, my father worked at Lime Street Station and I often think, 
he'd be there watching the trains go out. He would have been watching us from afar, but he wouldn't have been able to come over. And I don't remember the trip when we went to Chester, but being a little bit older, I remember the kids on the train. There's a cow, they'd never seen cows or fields before and getting all excited looking up the, the train windows. And then, I don't, we probably came into Chester. Oh, I remember we changed trains at Hooton and we were given a sandwich and an apple. But because we were twins, we got a sandwich and an apple between us. Maybe they thought we were Siamese twins, I don't know, and only one head. But we had to share that lunch. So when we got to, um, on the bus, we're getting close and the kids, I'm going to that house, they've got a horse. I'm going to that house, no, they've got sheep. I'm going to go to, they've got, and we were claiming houses all the way through to Threpwood. We got to the two-room school in Threpwood, or Threepwood, what did you say? Threepwood. Threepwood. And Mrs. Broad was there, she's an aunt or something of Jill. Somerset House. Yes. Somerset yeah. House. She was running, we met her there, and she was running the evacuation. The village people came down to the school, and they're picking out the children that they would like to have. Well, when Mrs. Broad saw my twin, Shirley and I, she said, you two stand over here. Well, that was because we didn't have pins, we had buttons on our clothes. Our hair was clean, our shoes were polished. We were nicely dressed, whereas we had these Catholic kids coming in from big families, all scruffy, and we were picked out first. Mrs Broad picked us out. So then the big boys went first. They could work on the farms. Now, these big boys have been told by their mother, I don't want you to be separated from your sisters. You all have to stick together. Well, how's somebody going to take in four children? Hmm. Can't take four of you. You know, they're all different ages. And uh, there's crying kids because they're being split up. We're standing back in the corner behind Mrs Broad. And this went on for a while about who's going with who and how many you're taking, so forth, so forth. And you have to realise the people are doing their best. You can see that from Chester, an older lady. The, oh, the last lady we were with, there was the older lady, Mrs Hughes, the posh couple that went in the service, and then I don't know the name of the last couple we were with, and we had to come back because my sister had to go back. She was too old. My mother got a letter from this family, from this woman. And my mother, and see her opening the letter, she opens letters. Oh, here's a letter from so-and-so. Oh, wow, when do I happen? Oh, dear. Oh. Oh, that's, oh, that's dreadful. Mama, Mama, what happened? What's the letter? What did they say? That woman died in childbirth. So we were with her. She was pregnant when she took us. At first pregnancy. And I think of her now. She was a little bit round. But we had no idea what that was about. And um, we probably came back. Because the doctor had said. You have to have bed rest. Or difficulties. And we had left with my sister. Maybe we're going to be moved again. I don't know. And my mother said to bring Pauline, bring the twins back. And so that woman was doing her bit for the war. She took us in. And she wasn't well enough to take in two little girls. She was doing her part. So we're in Threepwood now. And um, it was winter time. Everybody's gone, and oh, this lady has a car. We're going to be living with a lady who has a car. 
So we got in the back. We weren't going to Somerset House or whatever it's called. We were going to the Platt's house. And Mrs. Platt worked for Mrs. Broad. I believe she did her laundry. She would go to the house because I remember her doing the ironing, I think, at the Platt's house and folding all these, these boxes on the dining room table, folding them ever so carefully. That house, they had two children who were in boarding school, Patrick and Rosemary, boy and a girl, and she was sending their clothes off or taking them back for the broads to mail to them. We got to Mrs. Platt's house. I have to stand up for this. So, here's the doorstep. Mrs. Broad, Mrs. Platt opens up. I've told you I don't want any more vax. That's what we would call the evacuees, the vax. They're all right, just, and she's pushing us in, and Mrs. Platt's pushing us out. We're going <laughs> up the step and back again, and up the step. I've told you I've had my fill of these vax. Mrs. Broad says, take them for the weekend. I'll be back on Monday. And it's getting too dark now for me to drive them up to so-and-so and so-and-so who's going to take them. And it's too dark to take them. I'll be back on Monday. We were there for about two years. <laughs> <laughs> Now, the reason Mrs. Platt did that was she'd had a, a boy and girl evacuee who came from London, Liverpool, and um, the mother also lived in the village from Liverpool. And she would go over every evening to do the homework with them and tell them off if they didn't have the timetables and you should know this. And Mrs. Platt said to us, oh, it was just awful, you know, all that shouting and badgering about the timetables. Mrs. Platt was probably barely literate, and this just was more than she could take. Like, what's the fuss about learning to read and write? That got on her nerves, but eventually they went back to Liverpool. The next lot of evacuees were um, a couple of children who kept running away and they'd be brought back and one day their mother arrived at Mrs. Platt's door without warning to take her children back to Liverpool and Mrs. Platt was aghast because the woman was wearing plimsolls. <laughs> she was wearing plimsolls. Mrs. Platt, by the way, looked like Mary Poppins. <laughs> she was slim and she had dark, curly, naturally curly hair that she kept pinned up like this. And she wore like a Dutch hat, a dust cap, I guess it was, with a wide brim. And she usually had that on if she was dusting or cleaning. And a trim little figure and the black laced up shoes. She was Mary Poppins without the magic. <laughs> so this woman turns up at her door and Mrs. Platt can't get over her wearing plimsolls. And also the little boy that the woman had with her had a sailor suit on and from the trousers to the shirt, she had a pin keeping the trousers up. She'd never seen anything like it. She had a pin in the trousers, pinned to the shirt. The button was gone. Mrs. Platt was horrified. What kind of people are they? So she took her children back. I think I'd forgotten the story about the third lot. Well, we were the third lot, I think. She'd had a fill of evacuees coming and going and coming and going. So she'd said, that's it, I'm not having any more evacuees. That's when Mrs. Broad took her to her doorstep and she's saying, I don't, I'm not having any more, I'm not going through this. So we were there. 
and uh, we sat down for dinner and we're sitting at the table. I'm here, Shirley's there, Mrs. Platt's there because she would cut the bread. Mr. Platt's across from us and we just sat at the table. Now you have to understand, we came from a family of teenage girls and we were just dolls. Our feet hadn't touched the ground yet, we were six, we didn't do anything for ourselves, we were just on somebody's knee and tra la 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 la. We sat at the table and Mrs. Platt said, well, come along, are you, go are you going to eat? Start your dinner. And we said, who's going to cut our dinner up for us? And she says, you can't get, we probably had a push and spoon instead of a knife and fork. Mama had a business, she was busy with the shop and my younger, you know, sisters were doing all that kind of, you can't cut, you, well, you just cut it, she didn't cut it up for us, we had to learn overnight how to be, to do things. So the next thing is, we went to bed and we took our dresses or skirt and blouse off, whatever we were wearing. But we wouldn't take our underwear off, which was your knickers, a singlet, a liberty bodice. Do you remember the liberty bodices? They were like a, a padded shirt with buttons down for warmth. And we would, we would take the top. She says, well, come on, get into bed, get undressed. And we said, but what if there's an air raid? There won't be an air raid here, you're all right. So we reluctantly took our clothes off because we never got undressed with the bombing going on. You had to have took your top things off, your shoes right by you. You went to bed under the stairs or in an air raid shelter and you're ready to run or whatever. So that was a big thing. So then uh, the next day it was, um, when you come downstairs, I mean these polished sh chair, chair stairs all the way up, and when you, walk, when you got to the top of the stairs, you started walking like this because the floor was slanted and it was very polished and we had to walk through their bedroom to our bedroom and you were walking like this, you know, it was really different. When you come downstairs, there's no going back upstairs. You come down once a day, and then you go up to bed. Okay, well, there was nothing to go upstairs for, unless it was your netting or something. And then, have you ever washed dishes? No, I'll show you how. And so we would dry the dishes. And I think she taught us to peel potatoes or wash potatoes or something. But she was, oh, she showed us how to put elastic in our neck as if the elastic went. <laughs> All these little things, it was incredible. And I think they had only been married a short time, Mr. and Mrs. Platt, and they didn't have any other children. And so, am I telling this now about the school and the headmaster? Mm -hmm. So we went to school Monday. The school had two rooms and the village children were all moved into one room and the evacuees of all ages were in the second room. So the man who was our headmaster said, now when you go out to play, play time. Do not play with the children from this room because they're all Protestants. That's going to wake him up. <laughs> they lie, they steal, and they swear. That's what else they did. <laughs> they swore. And it's like, oh my God, what's... I mean, we were Catholic, but we weren't raised anything like that. My father never went to Mass or anything. So we st went out of playground, the kids were all on one end of the ground and we're here looking at them and thinking, 
they look the same as us. They don't look like Protestants, whatever they're supposed to be. So, um, and another rule was from the headmaster, don't play with the children from the village, only play with Catholic children from school. Now, did he ever think that we are sleeping in Protestant beds and we're eating at Protestant tables? No, evidently not. We didn't take any notice of that. Jill was one of our friends and village children. We didn't have uh, anybody close to us that was uh, an evacuee. So, Sunday mornings, a bus would come and pick us up to take us to Mass in Malpas. Six o'clock in the morning, it was dawn. <coughs> Mrs. Platt would put our hats on, give us a penny each to put on the plate, and that was it. Well, in the afternoon, our Protestant friends were going to chapel. And they'd say, come into chapel with us. We said, oh, we're not allowed because we're Catholic and we're just not allowed to go into a Protestant church. We'd go through this every weekend, every Sunday. And we'd wait for them outside the chapel. We didn't go in, but we waited for them. And so one Sunday, they said, I double dare you. I double, double dare you. Well, you can't say no to a double, double day. <laughs> so we went into the chapel. And when we were coming out of this, didn't impress me at all. No statues, no incense, no gold cups, no statues, nothing. No nice, pretty vestments on the minister, I thought. I'll never be a Protestant. It's not theatrical enough for me. I like all the glamour. Nobody had to worry about that. So as we were coming out of this very plain, ordinary Protestant church, a Catholic girl was passing and my twin said, oh, there's Margaret so-and-so, she'll tell, and we forgot completely about it. Next morning, Monday, we went to school, dawdled all the way there, jumping back and forth over these ditches with the water in them, splashing mud up all over ourselves. We got into the classroom and um, it's very quiet and everybody's sitting up like this at the desk and the teacher, I'm not saying his name because it's such a dreadful story, the, our headmaster was walking up and down and I wonder what's happening, I wonder what's going on. Something's happening. So then he says, what's your name? And we thought he meant who's who of the twins. I said, Vera, my sister said, Shirley. I mean, what's your surname? Well, we didn't really know what that was, but we thought it was our second name, Hannaway. What part, oh no, I is your father from the north or the south? So you know what that's about, don't you? We didn't know if it was south of the equator or we had no idea what he was talking about, north or south of what, what does that mean? Do you know what these girls did yesterday? They went into a Protestant church, into a chapel, and he's going on about us going into so um, that was that none of the kids in the room shunned us or made any comment it was just like it had never happened i don't remember anybody saying oh you're going to hell because you went into a brother's and shirt there was nothing like that but he did send my parents a telegram to tell them that the twins went into a Protestant church. When they received the telegram, my mother who had the shop and my father worked at Lime Street Station, 
she's serving um, cigarettes through the shop window that's just been blasted out. The bombs are falling and they get a telegram like this. My brother, who had said, I want you to send the, the twins away again, had been torpedoed by a German, by, um, torpedoed and picked up by a German ship and he was listed as missing in action. Now, 18 months later, they were informed that he was in a prison of war camp. But at that time, when that man sent the telegram, my brother was missing in action. All my older sisters were in the service. <clears throat> it was a dreadful, dreadful time. And this man is worrying about religion. It taught me a lot, it's like, never judge people, religion, colour or anything. He did me um, a service. So um, when we, oh, there was a time there with the Platts when they got a little boy from an orphanage in Birkenhead and he was a couple of years older than us. Well, we're girls and he's a boy and he's in mischief and stuff and we'd tattletale on him and tell Mrs. Platt. He just did so-and-so or he threw a stone at us or whatever. And Mrs. Platt told Will, her husband, I've had enough of this boy, Will. He's going back. So they sent him back to Birkenhead and a car came for him and it was full of kids, other little boys, and we went to the end of the driveway. He's getting into the car and the teacher or whoever is talking to Mrs. Platt and the other kids are saying to this little boy, you'll never get a home now because you've been, you'll have to stay in the orphanage forever. And they're taunting him. And I just felt awful. But on trips back to see the Platts and I said, you know that boy you had, remember, from the Birkenhead Orphanage? Oh, he was a dreadful boy. He was so naughty, she's going on. I said, well, I feel awful now because I feel it was our fault that you sent him back, but maybe we were jealous, I don't know. She said, it was nothing to do with you. I just, he was into stuff all the time. Well, we tattletailed on him, but, you know, I guess there was other stuff that we didn't know about. But I felt guilty, but um, she helped to take the gold away. And then we went home one time from my sister getting married. War was still on and we picked flowers and so forth. And when my parents would come to visit us, they would come in the springtime and they would come in the fall, I guess, you know, on the weather was before the snow. And they would come with an aunt and uncle who uh, Uncle Bob had um, a lorry business, <clears throat> uh, whatever, his haulage. And so he had the petrol that he could come and see us. And it took them hours to get here because there were no road signs. In case it was an invasion, they wouldn't know where they were. And if you asked anyone for directions, they wouldn't tell you in case you were a spy. <laughs> so we would start walking toward Malpas and we'd walk and walk and walk and finally we'd see the car come and they'd pull over and we'd get in the car and everybody would cry. Mum and Dada, Auntie and Uncle Bob. Well, one time, my twin Shirley had dropped a plate when she was drying dishes. And while this was a dreadful thing at that time to break a plate or lose anything, you know, and Mrs. Platt said, young Shirl, I'm going to tell your parents about this when they come next time. So we both fretted the whole time till Mama and Daddy came and Auntie and Uncle Bob, oh, they got to tell on us. So we got in the car and were crying and we told them Shirley had broken a plate and the Platts were going to, Mrs. Platt was going to tell them about it. And so they were all upset, the nerve of that woman, getting upset about a broken plate. And then I heard my mother say, 
Oh, they don't love them, you know. They're just taken care of them, but they don't love them. And hearing that was not, you know, good for a kid to hear that. And it wasn't until later years that I realised how much she did love us. They both did. And the thing with Mrs Platt, if you came in with a hair ribbon missing, we had braids, long plaits. Where's your ribbon? Look at your hair. And we'd have to go into the outside toilet and rub all the mud off our mats and brush ourselves down and fix our and be neat looking when we went in from school. Where have you been? What have you, you know, she wanted us to look good. And, you know, they, look, they were very good to us. They really were. It was just a child thing of they, we were in a completely different atmosphere than we'd had living at the shop and then going to the suburbs with older sisters. We didn't have jobs, they did it in um, I don't think we were fixing the elastic in our knickers, but, you know, that kind of thing. When we came back, Mama would say, they know the, the names of all the flowers, and they can sew, and they can do... And Mama was really loved to talk about that, that Mrs Platt had taught us all of this. My older sisters would have known all of that, but we were the babies. We were still the babies. So we what laughed... What do you remember about the house, the actual house you are in? Oh yeah, with yeah. the slanty floor going upstairs on that, and the stairs being very highly polished and kind of deep and having to be very careful. And a great <clears throat> big kitchen and a lord off the, the kitchen behind that kitchen wall and the fireplace and the living room. We'd have our bath in front of the fire on a Saturday night. And there's a picture, a famous picture of two little girls in a, it's like Victorian kind of looking, in um, a bathtub. And I, I uh, framed it and sent it to them and said that reminded me of when we were little in front of the fire. But that was sold when the house was sold. I, w I wanted it, but they said, who took care of the uh, their estate. It's gone to um, a shop in Wrexham or something. So, um, you know, what else when we left? I didn't even turn around and wave goodbye, I don't think. I don't remember the actual leaving. We'd been home one time to Liverpool for my sister's wedding. And then back again. And I remember, I guess my aunt and uncle and my mum and dad came for us and going through the Mersey Tunnel all the way back to Liverpool. I'm in the back of the car and I'm saying, are there still fields out there? Yeah, I don't want to look. I'm keeping my eyes closed till we got to Liverpool. Is there any more green, any tree? No, I'm not looking. And then when we're going through the, through the Mersey Tunnel, my auntie's saying, Dirty old Liverpool, I can smell it now. Well, you could smell, I remember smelling the bales of cotton from out of the warehouses thrown out in the street from, you know, a bombing and that's all smouldering. I mean, I remember the bombing vividly and the mum and dad were running out of the house and pulling me one way and then the, let's go down, no, we'll go to here and being pulled. That was the only time I ever remember them showing you know, that it's like, oh, God, what are we going to do? So my auntie's complaining about, and I'm like, oh, I couldn't wait to get through that tunnel and see the real Liverpool and the buildings, you know, half a building and rubble and, and all that. And, um, and I would think when I was a kid, I'd think, I'd like to go back to Liverpool for one day and I don't care if I get killed, I just want to go back. It wasn't the people, it was what we'd left the family with being older and part of it, the shop and um, friends. And one day, your parents were going to the Chester Zoo and we were going with you. It was a big outing. We were going to Chester Zoo and Mrs Platt said, which you shouldn't have, 
you might see people you know there in Chester Zoo because a lot of people from Liverpool go there. I did not see anybody, animals. I'm looking at everybody. I looked and looked at people's faces. Nobody was aware of it, of course. Looking for, I might see Uncle Bob, I might see Mrs. Dillon, I might see Mum and Dad, or I might see Mom. And that was the Chester Zoo. If they've got monkeys there, I didn't see them. It was just part of the thing. And, oh, I know, you are taking sandwiches. And I'm thinking, oh, God, I wonder what will be in the sandwiches. I bet it'll be, probably be, remember the meat paste or something like that? I'm thinking, I bet it's meat paste. And it was like, this is going to be delicious. And when we got the sandwiches, cucumber sandwiches. And I thought, <laughs> Cucumber sandwiches, I could have this in Liverpool or, or at the Platts. I thought the Broads would have something better than a cucumber <laughs> sandwich, so I was really disappointed. I'm mm. expecting biscuits and chocolates. Of course, there was nothing like that because they were on the same rations that we were on. And uh, so anyway, we left and I got married and then I started writing to them. And then whenever I came back to England, I always went to see them. And it wasn't until later years that I realised how heartbreaking it was for them to have us and then for us to just go out of their lives. And remember Mama saying one time, well, they'll miss you, you know, the Platts will miss you, not thinking anything about it. And then, not so much with Shirley, but with me. And I'd talk, Mum would say, Oh, you sound just like Mrs. Platt. You sound Welsh or something. <laughs> and I had to say, whatever I'd said, I'd repeat it. So it didn't sound like local, like here. A Liverpool accent was much better. So, uh, no, they didn't say that, but it irritated Mama that I would be singy singy just like the welsh sing you sing your words and um on one of the visits back mrs platt had broken her hip and she was in hospital and i persuaded my twin sister to come to come and see them with me and when we walked into the door is it called a dorm, the big room in the hospital? The ward, I mean, when we walked into the ward. Mrs. Platt was in a room with all men, and she's back in the corner here, the only woman in the thing. She's like in her 80s. And my sister and I, my twin and I, are going to walk past the matron. She said, just a minute, where are you going? We're in visiting hours. And we said, well, we've come to see Mrs. Platt. Oh, go ahead. That's all she's done is talk about you. And so we went to see her and she pleased to see us. And then a nurse came to give her medication. And she says to the nurse, these are my twins. Well, when she said, these are my twins, I felt like, oh my God, what if Mama had heard that? Because Mama was possessive with us. It would be the same thing, like a divorce, like, well, I hope they don't forget that we're the real mother and father, you know, even though they would want the foster parents to be good to them, like, will they be, will we lose their love? I'm sure they would think that. And here, when she said that, I just could have cried. I thought, oh, isn't this so sad? And then came to see her again. And I'd never asked her about how she felt. And I said to her, um, well, how did you feel when we left you? And she said, well, I kept going to the window and looking for you coming home from school to see you walking down the lane. And I was so lost and I, I just didn't know what was the matter with me. And I couldn't understand it while well, she was grieving, but she'd never grieved and she didn't know what this feeling was. 
So I said, well, did you have anything of art? She said, no. You took everything with you when you left. That would be your socks and every little combs or whatever you had. And she said, um, all I had left was a button. I said, a button? What do you mean a button? She said, well, you know, my button box. I had a button off one of your coats. That was the only thing she had of us. And I think, and ladies, we should have invited her to our weddings. You know, she should have, could have been always a part of our family, but it was like, it was too much a part of the war and get past that and leave that all behind you and let's get on with our lives. And Mr. Platt, I mean, he was a lovely man. There was a film made about a man with cattle and pigs and I'd see pictures of the man in the movie and I think that's Mr. Platt. He had sandy coloured hair and a ruddy complexion and he was very kind of up and outgoing where she was the serious one. Oh the one time when we came back to see them, oh my cousin, not the one I'm with now but her father, insisted he was going to take me to the Platts and we stopped he wasn't a drinker, but we stopped for a coffee or something in a pub or a cafe on the way, and I'm saying, they're waiting for us, and they have the table set. And he was very kind of like on one foot and then the other, just Ted. Couldn't wait to leave. And, um, well, come on, we're ready to go. We've got to get Lucy from school or Jane from school. They have to get back to pick up from school. And Mrs. Platt brought a pie out. And she cut me a piece of pie and Mr. Platt says, Is that all you're giving her? You'd give her a bigger piece than that. Well, there was plenty of pie, but that was Mr. Platt. Is that? And he said to me one time, that was after she died, he said, We never bought a jar of jam all the time we were married. Well, I really was, didn't know what that was about. What he was saying was, she was such a good provider. She made every jar of jam they ever ate. I remember my mother used to make jam, but you know, people don't make jams now, but to him it was, she made every jar of jam. Jam all up here in the cupboard, she made every jar. And you know, she was a good cook and the pies and the custard and all that stuff. But we were, blessed to go to them because a lot of children were badly treated uh, you know had to work in the farm in the oh one time we did go when it was harvest time and we all went to one farmer's field and we went and it was that i can remember that date now i got a seed of something in my eye my eye was all swollen for a few days but being with other kids and all the village was there and it was really a happy time i just loved it with all the people around and throwing stuff up on the, the back of the wagon. Oh, and when we stopped in Malpas and looking at the cross in the middle of the Malpas there, the little statue. One time we went on a bus with children from the village. I don't know how we ever arrived there or why we were allowed to go, but we went on the bus and uh, my sister and I, all the kids were playing around that cross. And some man kept asking us where we lived and what was our name and so forth. And, you know, and what he heard our Liverpool accents and knew we weren't from there and he thought we were runaways. The, kept, the evacuees kept running, trying to find the way back to Liverpool. And uh, he asked the other kids, who, who were who were from the village here? Who were we, and uh, what did we live with somebody? And they said, "Oh, they're with us. Yeah, they're okay. They're they're with us." But that was another part of it, you know. And then the food, surely one time. Well, Mama said, "I thought that when you went to the country, you'd have eggs and fruit and all that, but it wasn't really that way." I think the ration was one fresh egg a month and the other was the powdered Found eggs. Egg. And we got one fresh egg between us 
and one time Shirley asked for another piece of bread. She'd have the bread cut, you know, in half, like if you dropped it, it would float to the floor. And Shirley said, uh, could I have another piece of bread? And Mrs. Platt said, now young Shirl, you know the rule. One or two pieces of bread. So, but it was like that everywhere. You know, it was like that everywhere. I'm not complaining about it, but it's just little things that I remember. But I'm so glad that I did go to see them after we'd left and I would write to them, send a card every Christmas and I've kept all the letters. Mr. Platt wrote the letters. Every letters from one Christmas to the next is the same pretty well. We're all fine, you know, that kind of thing. Hope you're keeping well. But that was um, the evacuation experience. And Joel was asking me just before in the, in the cafe about our clothes. Mama got a list of the clothes that we had to have, which included clogs, never worn clogs, laced up boots to your ankle, and ankle bands that we had for church, that we had on for church and off again. It was a treat to wear the boots on the weekend and the clogs that they, or maybe it was vice versa, maybe the clog, the boots in school and the clogs on the weekend, I don't know. But that, and you had a list of clothes that you had to have. And how these big families did it, I don't know, because, you know, I had my mother in the shop and my father working and um, <coughs> we weren't, you know, desperate like the rest of the um, people in Liverpool. So do you remember if they had running water and things like that? Oh gosh, I'm glad you asked me that. They had running water at the tap, but then the drinking water came from the well here. From the pump outside here? Mm -hmm. From so they had to carry the water. You were oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Had to, yeah. Had to carry oh, the village yeah. came here for this water. Mm. And they would have the thing. The yoke on it. The yoke, the yoke, yoke that was, carried. You know, it was like we were on the be the very end of an era, mm. you know. And the same in Liverpool, the very end of an era. Because I read the um, Shirley Hughes books. And she's a relative of. T.J. Hughes in Liverpool, the big department store, and the story about coming from Wales and so forth, and showing how they washed and all. I thought, oh, that's the way Mama had to do it before we moved, and then she would use the laundry for the for our clothes and sheets. So how did this cook? Sorry, excuse me. Uh, candles for the oh, they would have paraffin lamps. Is that it? Yes, paraffin yes, lamps, lamps, yeah. and candles. I think the candles was to take us up to bed, you know, and then blow it out. Yeah, so... And how did she cook? What did she cook on? Well, she had a... She had, um, I guess what you call a range in the kitchen. I don't recall that she cooked on that fireplace, you know, the big black. She might have, but I don't recall. I remember when we were at the shop, and my mother had that kind of a range where stuff would go in and out of the oven on each the side. And I don't remember with Mrs. Platt if she did that or if she had um, something in that big kitchen. Would she have a stove or even a cala gas stove or something like that? I think she might have had a stove. So if she made a lot of jam, she must have put oh, something. Oh, she made, pa there was always a dessert after a meal. So did they have fruit bushes? Do they do this? Do they yeah, provide they themselves? did. They had gooseberry bushes, and they had a whole row of them. And Mrs. Platt said, "If you eat the gooseberries, you get nits in your hair." <laughs> <laughs> so we never ate the gooseberry bushes in case we got nits in our hair, and then she would know. She had a huge. It was called a Victoria plum tree. Aspalage, what's the word when it grows against? Aspalia, yeah. Aspalia. Against the side wall of the house, the cottage, with these huge Victoria plums. I ate one once. I picked one, actually picked one off and ate it. 
and buried the stone because we weren't allowed to be <laughs> rude because <coughs> if you had fruit like the gooseberries and the plums you had to turn it I don't I guess it was you had to turn it in because somebody would come and collect all that for to go into the shops they would sell it or would she make jam with it? Probably wouldn't. Oh, she, she would make jam, mm. but she didn't give us gooseberries or plums to just eat. Say, uh, you know, or, you know, no, we didn't do. We didn't never picked anything. And one time, my sisters who were in the service came in the uniforms, and God knows how they got here. I don't know. And she had bushel baskets of the plums and gooseberries and different things in the kitchen waiting to be picked up and they were saying, gosh, those plums look delicious. She didn't offer them one. It was like money coming in, you see. Perhaps she took them to market at Wrexham. Or took the jam. Mm -hmm. Or both. Mm -hmm. um, because that's what happened to that. I had a feeling that if you had stuff like that and you had a farm and you were in the country that you had to get, not give it but sell it to the government that they would take it <coughs> because there was such a shortage mm. of food i might be wrong there I maybe apply to I, some foods i think pardon that apply to some foods i think yeah certainly animals mm. i remember they had a pig slaughtered and it was a big secret it was between, because you weren't allowed to do that. You weren't allowed to slaughter a pig and just eat it yourself. So did they have pigs at Quinter House? Did they have a pig in the backyard? They did. I think, no, I don't know where he got the pig. Mr. Platt got a pig and it was being slaughtered there and there were other farmers in on it. It was all whispers. And, you know, don't say anything about this pig like to anybody and I guess they took slices off it you know cut it up but it remember it hanging up there in the back of the house uh, oh it might have been in that larder in the back of the kitchen maybe this is what turned me off meat so we would have the ham and all the fat of the ham that much round the piece would be on it and we'd have to eat it oh, oh god you couldn't leave anything and I'd have it in my mouth and save it in my mouth and go outside and sp after the meal and spit it out and bury it or something so they wouldn't know I hadn't eaten the fat. I can't eat ham today. Anything Platts, with did, fat on it. Did Platts have any children of their own? No, th that was the saddest no. part about it. They never... They were, I think they were newly married when we went there mm. and they never had children. We were their children. When yeah. she introduced us to the nurse, these are my twins. And then I met a cousin when we came to her funeral, a niece or something of the Platts, and she said, oh, all she talked about was the twins. Bell, Bell she Dutton. talked. Bell oh, right, okay. Taranty, yeah. yeah. Okay. Belle Dutton is Belle Belle Dutton. It was her auntie we're talking oh, about. Mrs. Okay. Mrs. Platt. Mrs. Platt. Oh right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Mm. yeah. All she talked about was the twins. Do you remember where the milk came from? Did they go with a can to the farm? A farm. I don't remember where the milk came from. So maybe I my maybe Bourne's doing the that. Bank. If you worked at Bourne's yes. the Bank, I should think. Mm. You get to take a can with you. Get a can it day. came in the yeah. great big uh, cans, the milk cans, didn't it? I remember yeah. seeing. We used to have a, a cows white bin. enamel can. That's like right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The, the it must have can. been at the farm where he worked, going there and seeing the cows being milked. A long row of cows, but they didn't have. Cow. They had, I think, two acres, and they had chickens, and there was a pond close to where you came around the road at the end of their property and uh, Saturdays we cleaned the hen house out and so we'd be there the hen house is on legs I guess it's up and we'd be in the hen house 
and you have to get a shovel and just scrape up all the chicken dirt. Yeah. And if somebody was going by, we'd be standing in the end and we could see over the hedge and we'd be standing talking to whoever was going by. You know, they knew we'd be, I don't know if it was adults or children, we'd spend half the day out the, the things talking to uh, neighbours going by with the hens, cleaning up the hen house on Saturdays. You spent quite a lot of time down here too as well, didn't oh, you? Oh, and then we'd come here to play. Now, we used to go up the road to a couple of girls up there, but mostly it was here. And so, Jill, how much did we decide? I'm four years younger than you, or you're four years <laughs> you're old? You're four years older than me. Are you sure? <laughs> 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 so, at the back of the cottage, at the back of this house and the garden, there was a little alcove, and it had a long bench on it, and there were cushions on the bench, I believe. It was upholstered. And we call that Rose Cottage because there was a rose that went right over the front of it. So it was Rose Cottage. And we would take dolls. They're probably all your dolls, Jill. I don't remember having dolls. And we'd have them all spread out on here and we would play house. I guess combing dolls' hair and bathing them, dressing and undressing. And we would do that for hours. And all of a sudden, Jill's mother was always in a hurry. She was always running. Very slight woman, I remember. <laughs> and she'd be in the house, saying, she probably thought, oh, God, I better go and check on the children. And she'd come running, running around. And she wouldn't come right in. She'd, we're here, and she'd go, oh, are you all right? OK. And then she'd run back again into the house. She was busy. <laughs> Very, very bit. That sounds like my mother. I'm a very busy woman. I've got a shop to run. And then it would be, um, she would ask us to pick. It was either black currants or currants. I think it was black currants. You Not black currants. All this end. Currants. There used to be fruit, black currants and things. Okay. Black currants so we'd things. pick the black currant. Now in the States, they have black currants and red currants, but they're a big berry. I remember these as being small berries, mm. aren't they? The black currants. The black currants, yeah. And she'd give us each um, a bowl, pick these black currants. For, well, we'd be picking and then we'd stop and play. And then we'd pick and then we'd go and run off somewhere. Then we'd come back and pick and she'd come out and she'd say, are you ready? Have you got the... And she'd look at the bowls of be maybe five berries at the bottom. Oh, I thought you'd have more than that. She'd have the pastry ready in here. And she's in the middle of baking and she's waiting for the fruit. She didn't shout at us now. I never remember. My mother never shouted at us. She told us off and said, Oh, for goodness sake, can't you do better? She'd just say, Oh, I thought you'd have... And then she'd go back in the house and then she'd come out again. So then we'd get cracking after she'd told us. And then she'd come out again. Probably take three times for her to come out, for her to get enough to make a pie. I remember picking the pie and then I remember coming into the shop with Mrs. Platt probably. And uh, your grandmother would be in the shop. I think she was probably in her sixties then, just thinking about how she, would be, she yeah. looked. Yeah, and she'd be kind of at the one end of the shop, and uh, the counter was down here, and I guess into the house was somewhere. On the, and her oh, always being so nice. I think she came to the zoo with us with the cucumber sandwiches <laughs> instead of the meat paste, and. Um, and, her, and then Mr. Broad, your father, handsome young man. I mean, they were very young. They must have only been 30 or less than that at that time. And you came in the back and there were big, big doors, double doors. And you come in through the back and behind the one on the right, there was a whole big patch of nasturtiums, that orange flower. Oh, yeah. Yeah, nasturtium. And I think there'd be a lot of caterpillars oh, on yes. the, the caterpillars. Yes. Yeah, and then on this side was the bakery. 
and her father was running the bakery. I don't know, I don't remember any other men there. There had to be other people there working for him. And then the bread was sold in the shop. Yeah, and on the vans, went round the vans. Oh, did it really? Yeah. It went on delivery. And then, did you have wheels of cheese in the yeah, shop? Yeah, she had big, the big cheeses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember the big pounds, cheeses. Yeah. And it, but I was think I think that cheese. It, oh, they couldn't have big cheeses in the war, but I guess that was all rationed and you sliced it up. Oh, and then my mother would send us our sweets because Mama had a sweet shop to back in this news agent, and she would send us a box of sweets every week or every month, and they were all under the um, the sideboard thing in the living room the box and when we came in from school we could get one sweet each or five dolly mixtures <laughs> and I know when we left and she probably gave our sweet coupons to her nieces because we wouldn't have been buying sweets no. when we were getting them sent from the shop and I guess you know they were just all left there but it seems like there was an awful lot of sweets there but we never had and we never thought to sneak one when nobody was looking or anything. We just didn't. It was the one sweet, and then we just followed the rules, and we did the same at home. And living in a sweet shop, we'd never have uh, taken anything. And then there was something else I was thinking of that just slipped my mind then. <coughs> Were you always um, segregated, segregated in school? No, there were the boys and girls in our classroom. No, but in terms of evacuees and love. Oh, no, oh yeah, we couldn't be with the Protestants. No, no, Are you no. kidding? Ah, we'd come to a bad end. We would have been swearing and stealing. <laughs> oh no, oh no, right, the, so. they had. This is the whole thing. They gave up half the school for the evacuees. Mm -hmm. They went into the one room and we were in another room. Of all ages, they took all the state ages and different forms in there, and we had form here and a form there with the bigger kids. And um, so, do you uh, know what religion this headmaster was? I mean, was he a Catholic? Oh, well, he? yes, he was. He was Catholic. Irish, I think. Bigoted Catholic, really, really bigoted, wasn't he? Oh gosh, yeah, absolutely. Really, really oh, was. I mean, it's a story that's. But he was teaching Protestant children. No, no, teaching he was Catholic only teaching children. the Catholics. Oh, the Catholic. They weren't to mix with the Protestants. Okay. Where they? So yeah. was he making the he big assumption? He came with us. That they were all Catholics. Oh, he came with you. No, no this is it. We, you would be evacuated with your school. Not the whole school. Those who had applied to be evacuated. Mm -hmm. They would all go to gather to a, a certain village. And um, when we got to this village, Thrapwood, Threepwood, it was a two-room school. And mm. we got one room, yep. okay. the Catholics, the evacuees, mm -hmm. and the Protestants were all together. And they had their own headmaster. Yeah. They had their own teacher. Yeah. Well, oh, we never were together, only on the on the playground yes. and don't play with the Protestants and you know what else he did he put a rope across the playground one side was the Protestants and one side was the Catholics and I'd forgotten about the rope and that Mr. Shannon came to see Mrs. Platt when we went to go on, doesn't matter she wasn't going to say his name, but it doesn't matter. Okay. He's, probably, he's probably dead by now. He is. He died of a heart attack up the church bank coming back from school huh. in his 40s. Yeah. Right. yeah. And I was happy. I That's thought, I'm glad he's dead. Yeah. Glad he's dead. Um, <laughs> what was telling you? The rope. Oh, yeah, the rope. And on a visit to Mrs. Platt, she said, well, that man was awful, you know, putting that rope up in the school across across the playground so we wouldn't be with one another yeah. and uh, I said oh I don't remember that she said oh yes she said and I told him as well and then my twin Shirley 
talking about, when I talked about evacuation and said, those people that took us in, there was never any religion or talk about it. There was no name calling about us being Catholic or Liverpudlians or Vax or anything like that. He said they were really, really nice people. And my twin said, yes, but they put that rope up across, across the playground. I said, oh no, they didn't put the rope up, Mr. Do, Mr. Badman. He put the rope up to separate us sleeping in their beds and eating at the tables. So which church or chapel did you go into? You say you went into one. You... Into a chapel. Which, well, into, where into, into the chapel. Into the chapel. The, the chapel. 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 Chapel that's no longer a chapel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you know, one time um, we went with them to that church with the plaques to the harvest celebration. After the Harvest Festival. Harvest Festival. Um, we don't have that in the Catholic Church. We went to the Harvest Festival and feeling, and being in that church and having them each side of us and feeling so secure and we're in, it was almost like we're in here with our mum and dad kind of thing and they probably felt like with our children. And I just loved being in that church with them gave me a great feeling of happiness and security being in that church when they took us to the festival. What, um, did, what did the, the teachers think about you going into the chapel then? Oh, well, we didn't tell them, did we? They wouldn't know. And I think he was dead by then, hopefully. He was only in his 40s. <laughs> oh, That's yeah, a shame. he was a young man. They lodged with my grandparents at Boundary House. Right. This Mr and Mrs Shen, and they were both teachers, and mm. they got this one son called Joe. And he was coming up the church bank from school one day, he'd only be 40-odd, Yeah. and he collapsed and died with this heart attack. Okay. Maybe, Maybe it was because we son. went into a Protestant and church. And then the wife and son went to live at the White Cottage. Oh, right. Okay. And then she 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 continued on with you, didn't she, with the school? Mrs. Oh, yes, Shen. she did. And she, I was telling Jill, I just loved her and her son. And she would help me with reading. She was our teacher of the younger children and he taught the older children. I don't remember if we got a different teacher after that. We would have to, I don't know. But um, she was a lovely woman, very warm, very loving and nurturing. And I remember going, and I kind of liked her son.